Good morning. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed because people are giving me all kinds of things to say and I said more than one item? Like, it's just, this isn't good. But anyways, hopefully I get everything said that I'm supposed to say up here and someone will yell if I don't. Welcome everyone. Welcome if you are a visitor. Welcome if you're a regular. Welcome to everybody online who either for your first time are here or you've been here before. It's uh, really awesome to have everyone join us this morning. And how are you enjoying the second winter? Like we had a little spring and almost a summer, and then we're back to winter. I thought that like a nice warm plaid was kind of, it fit, and long johns and all this stuff that, yeah, we're kind of back, aren't we? But it, actually, it feels good not to have the sloppy, so I think that's kind of good. Um, what else am I supposed to say here? Okay, announcements. Did everyone get a bulletin? If you didn't, you can raise your hand, and there's no one at the back that will give you one, so. <laughs> no, you can grab one on your way out. out. There are a few things that I will draw your attention to. One is there's a potluck today after church. And so everyone is welcome to head to the gymnasium and um, participate in the potluck today. Um, the Ladies Island Gospel Women in Mission elections happened. And there's a little paper that looks like this. It's at the back. And it has uh, all the results. And if you have questions or anything, you could ask El Presidente Doris Wall, uh, Vice President Anita, Secretary Doris, and, and Ruth Ann, uh, Treasurer Rosalie. There's food committee in all those committees that Mennonites do. Okay, so there's, there's a bunch of committees as well. And so, um, yes, if you want to know the results of that, then grab one of these sheets on your way out. Uh, tomorrow morning is the quilting uh, ladies, fellowship -y time, coffee in the lower auditorium. And Marion has, like, whirlwind. You know, people have been there, and there's, I don't know, 40 quilts that are close, and, and they're hoping to take them down to Abbotsford. And so come and join. That's fun. Um, there's a coffee time first, and then you quilt for a while, then you, have, you get lunch, like, and then uh, you quilt some more if you want. So um, ladies are all welcome to come to that. I will mention that there is going to be a ladies' retreat this year for the first time in a few years, and our tentative date is May 5 to 7 at Utsa Lake Bible Camp, and so put it on your calendar so that it doesn't get taken up by something else. It's a really fun time to come out and uh, just enjoy visiting with people in a most beautiful setting in the world, perhaps. Uh, walking club, we're still doing Tuesdays and Thursdays, so everyone should come and walk where it's warm and not slippery. There are many prayer requests listed in the bulletin there, so grab a bulletin, take it home, leave it on your table where you eat breakfast or whatever, however you do, whatever you do to, for your reminder, just to remember to pray for all the different needs that are listed there. Oh, and, I almost lost one, pickleball is starting. It'll be on Monday afternoons and Friday mornings in the gymnasium. Even if you have questions about pickleball, what pickleball is, or anything about that, then you should talk to Norm and Marion, and they'll be able to give you some information about that. It's like a phenomenon around the world. So, I mean, IGF needs to be on that train. So, Mondays and Fridays. I think I did it. Did any, is, are there any other announcements that I missed? Oh, I missed one. Oh, oh, there are receipts. Uh, and other correspondence in the mailboxes at the back. So go there afterwards. And Bill, Bill wants to talk as well. Go ahead, Bill. What does Bill have to say? Okay, for everyone who didn't hear that, the parking lot has been slipperier than it is now, but it's still slippery. So be careful. Okay? Everyone, watch when you're coming into the church. Yeah, some parking lots aren't so slippery, but this one is quite slippery. So that's true. That's true. Thank you for that information. Okay, a number of months ago when I opened, I talked a little bit about light. 
I talked about, and, you know, I'm not that you'll remember everything I ever say up here, but, you know, different forms of light, and I had a little demo about different flashlights and different, and that we could be a light in the world. Today, a little bit of a different form of light. I'm going to use the same word, but in a different context. This time, light, I'm talking about as in not heavy light, as in burden kind of light. We recently got a new puppy, and oh my word, cute. She's now four months old, and when we got her, she was 10 pounds. And she's about four months old now, and she weighs about 30 pounds. So I used to say, oh, this little dog is quite light. And now I don't say that anymore. When I go to pick her up, I can barely pick her up. She still thinks she's a lap dog at 30 pounds, but she's going to be about 100. So there's a bit of training to happen in between there, some reality checks about where she's going to sleep. Anyways, the dog used to be light, as in weight heavy. Um, when our oldest daughter, Amy, was a little girl, she was out in the parking lot uh, or somewhere in the yard working with her dad, and she was going to help him move a battery. So she went over, and you know, there's a handle on the top of the battery, and so she goes to move it, and she says to her dad, it's stuck to the ground. <laughs> it wasn't really stuck to the ground, it was just that that burden was too heavy for her little arms to pick up. Another uh, idea about light. My husband says that the only people that are his age or so will remember this song, but how many people, hmm, are you going to date yourselves, remember the song, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. Oh, look at this. You're definitely dating yourselves. It's about the same, you're right, Cliff. It's about the same generation. Uh, so, for you, those of you who don't know the song, uh, you need to Google it afterwards because it's a classic. Um, it's from the late 60s. Somebody sang it first, then Neil Diamond grabbed it and it became a hit for him. And it's talking about these two brothers who are traveling down a road. And one brother is saying to his other brother, you know, he ain't, he or to saying to people around him, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. So now we know that the little boy was strong, but his grammar wasn't super strong. So, but, but for your interest's sake, because I know you want to know this, this, this saying actually originated from a magazine cover in the early 40s that showed an older brother carrying a little brother, and it had that same caption. So that's where the song kind of came from. He ain't heavy, it's my brother. Come on, you guys, you, yeah. You, you could all sing along. I know you could, some of you. So another idea about something being heavy, a burden being heavy. So. I was thinking about when we are feeling down, when we have something going on in our lives, who is it that we turn to first or think of first? Do we talk to our spouse? Do we talk to a friend? Uh, maybe your pastor, a relative, a, a mother, a sister, brother, someone who's close to you. And I, I've done it myself where I sort of think, why did I, why did I immediately think, oh, I gotta talk to, I gotta text so-and-so about this, or I need to phone my sister, or, why do we not think of talking to Jesus first? Um, you know how I love the old hymns. And so the one that came to mind was written by a fellow named Jeremy, Jeremiah Rankin. It's entitled, Tell It to Jesus. So this old hymn is kind of like, it's sort of like Ecclesiastes, where it's saying there's nothing new under the sun. Because it says, are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. The chorus goes on to say, tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Now, I'm not advocating that we never talk with someone else and debrief, and, and there are lots of great counselors out there, even if, it, if you needed to talk with someone professionally about some things that are going on in your lives. But the other verses say, do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Have you sins that two men's eyes are hidden? Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Are you anxious? What shall be tomorrow? Are you troubled at the thought of dying? For Christ's kingdom, are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. So in Matthew uh, 11, 28, 29, it says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. 
One commentary says that Jesus' gracious invitation comes to all who are weary and burdened with the troubles of life and sins of their own human nature. By coming to Jesus, becoming his servant and obeying his direction, he will free you from your insurmountable burdens, that heavy battery that stuck to the ground, and give you rest and peace, and his Holy Spirit will lead you through your life. What trials and cares you carry will be borne by his help and grace. Okay, the commentary didn't talk about the battery being stuck to the ground. I inserted that part. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Christ sympathizes with our weaknesses, and he became our high priest so that we could approach the throne of God with confidence, knowing that our prayers and petitions are welcomed. Sometimes when you probably talk to a friend, if you've talked to them about it before, they might actually be rolling their eyes and going, oh my goodness, here, there, this, this same issue is still coming up for them. God never rolls his eyes at us, proverbially. He, he always welcomes our petitions. Our prayers and petitions are welcomed by him. What an awesome thought. It is called the throne of grace because it flows from God's love and his help and his mercy and his forgiveness and his wisdom everything that we need in every circumstance. He's there for us. David was a man who had learned to trust in God. In Psalm 55, 22, he wrote, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. And the end of Psalm 55, 23, but as for me, I will trust in you. Psalm 56, 3 says, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. Our worries, things that burden us, Jesus already knows all about them. And he's been there ahead of us, and he has a plan. So turn first to the one who can really aptly carry our burdens. And then his yoke is easy, and his burden is light, and he will give you rest. Let's just open with a word of prayer. Father God, we're so privileged and blessed and thankful that we can come to you and that you are listening and you care and you already know all these circumstances. You know the things that we're going to go through that we're going through right now. I pray for all of those who are here that may have things that are just burdening them. I pray that we will be able to take them to your throne and leave them there because you are the one who can carry them so much better than us. I pray for all those who are listening online for the same thing, anyone who's in a hospital or can't get out or who is feeling sick or just feeling down or feeling overwhelmed. Please just fill their rooms with your love and your goodness and your compassion, and your grace. And we thank you for your love and your goodness to us. We thank you for this beautiful sunny day. And we pray that you be with us now as we worship and as we learn of you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As the worship team will come. And as they come, I just want to thank the worship team, the, because during the week, so many times the songs we've sung had come to mind. And it's just, uh, it's really uplifting. So good on ya. Y'all. That's for Becky. Y'all. Because it was more than one person. Good morning. Would you please stand and sing with us if you are able? If you're not able to stand, and I understand that problem, then just sit and sing your heart out from the bench. with thanksgiving.
Yeah.
they're gone. If you didn't notice, Ed and Ruthann aren't here today. They are suffering on the beaches in Mexico. Someone has to do it. 
Actually, they might be home now, and then they have another week of holidays to recover from being with the little boys for five days or more. Anyways, uh, we're privileged today to have Pete Dirksen from Vanderhoof come and speak to us, and so we'll welcome him to the platform right now. Thank you. Well, good morning. It is good to be with you folks again. It's been, been a while since uh, I have been here. We always have enjoyed coming to uh, visit you folks and given the chance to, to speak. And uh, thanks, Bill. And so it's uh, last time that, that we would have come here, we would have uh, come from Vanderhoof. And I guess we did come from Vanderhoof because that's the only way to get here, right? But, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, uh, because of health reasons, uh, we had some bumps in the health road just over a year ago, and uh, I, uh, uh, we felt it was time that, that I would retire. And so at the end of August, I retired. And uh, uh, we have, have uh, we are enjoying semi-retirement. We, I had the privilege uh, through that transition and needing to not work full time that I have taken a position with our conference, with the Evangelical Mennonite Conference as their Western ambassador. And part of what the, what we are, what the EMC has been trying to do already for a number of years, but it only came to fruition now, um, I, but is that they have long to have a person, an EMC person, in Alberta and BC. And so, as, as the Western Ambassador, I get the privilege of representing the EMC at, uh, at if there are deacon commissionings or pastor ordinations or just whenever there's an, an event where the EMC is asked to be at, then if it's Alberta and BC, then I have the privilege of going. But I think even the more enjoyable part for me, though I enjoy that as well, because there's always lots of fun and food and fellowship. <laughs> but uh, what I really enjoy is being a pastor to the pastors. And we have a number of younger pastors starting in, in churches, and I get to enjoy um, connecting with them, mentoring them, but just as a whole, uh, between Region 1 and Region 2, we are 14 churches. And so I travel to those 14 churches just by way of encouraging, meeting with the pastors, meeting with the boards, uh, or the leadership of the church, whatever, however they have it. And uh, I am really enjoying that. Um, I, the head, uh, our office staff is changing. If there's a time when you pray for the EMC head office, um, we have been in a lot of transition in the last year and a couple of years, and it has to do with a, lot, a number of our staff retiring. And uh, the result of that is that there will only be one executive director left in June. Otherwise, they will all be new. And Gerald Reimer, you may remember, he's probably been up here. He is the only exec executive director that, that is left um, in, in the office. Uh, Tim Dick will be retiring at the end of June as our executive director, and Emery Plett will be our new executive director starting in June. Uh, Emery has been the principal at Steinbach Christian Schools for many years, and he's going to take on this role. Starting January 1st, we had Andy Woodward. He has started as our conference pastor. So he will be taking on the role that Leighton Friesen had before Leighton. It was Dave Thiessen, right? And he would travel here. And so Andy Woodward is taking on that uh, role. Uh, Mo Friesen is taking on the ministry to the next generation. So kind of connecting with our youth, Abundant Springs, which is happening again this year. Um, and uh, uh, that is Mo Friesen. Uh, he grew up in a, a pastor's home. Uh, Wilbur and Hilda Friesen are his, are his uh, parents. I don't know if you know them. I know them from years ago when they were pastoring. And uh, so, yes. And we are still looking for a director of global outreach or our missions person. Uh, Ken Zacharias retired as well. And uh, so uh, 
In the last couple of years, we've had Charlie Coop retire, and then Gerald Reimer took his place in the task force. We've had Ken Zacharias retire. We've had Terry Smith retire. We've had uh, Leighton Friesen move on. He is now at Steinbeck Bible College. And so there is just a lot of transition going on there. And then I'm new to them as well. I'm just quarter time, but uh, um, I am really enjoying that as well. We, we desire to, uh, to, uh, um, to be a support and a help to the local church. And uh, one of the things that, that we, we are, is a big part of our work is trying to find uh, pastors and missionaries, pastors for the churches that need pastors, whether they're youth pastors or uh, senior pastors, and then missionaries as well. We have more opportunities to send out missionaries into our world right now than we have uh, people to fill those, those roles. And so um, that's something that we are um, trying to kind of uh, really work on this year. There's a, lot, a number of, of our EMC uh, uh, publications that are out there. Um, many of you may get the messenger in the mail. Um, the, it's seeing as we're moving into a, an, uh, the era where social media is, is a big part of, of people's lives, we are also the, uh, something like the messenger. It is the same thing as the messenger, except there's a lot of links in it. It's, uh, you know, um, that, that we get to, get, get to send out. Uh, it's called the EMC Today. And you can get that by email. If you ever, um, if you want to get into more deeper theological stuff, Growing Together it has a lot of good discussion papers um, that get you thinking and get you studying. Um, you go to our website, uh, EM Conference, and you will find a lot of those there that you can, can sign up on. So that's, that's the EMC uh, Western Ambassador hat. You know, I'm going to get a hat made up yet so I can take it off and, you know, now I'm done with that. But, <laughs> no, that, that's uh, part of my role, that uh, new role that I am enjoying. So, as we get into God's Word today, I want you to if you, uh, take your Bibles or take your phones and, and would you turn with me to Ephesians, I mean to Hebrews chapter 1. And as, as we turn to that passage of Scripture, I want us to consider a question. And this is the question. How would you describe your Christian life? How would you describe your Christian life? Would you say, I'm not even sure that I am a Christian? Would you say it's struggling? How would you describe it? Would you say it's a complete failure? Would you say it's victorious. And you might ask, okay, well, what do you mean by victorious? The others are kind of, we know kind of where they're at, but victorious. Well, if we, uh, I was thinking of, of, uh, of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I know yesterday when Alex and Bill and I were having coffee, we actually talked about this, uh, ver these verses of, of Scripture, because Paul writes about kind of this type of thing, about victorious. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I find myself should be, I find, I myself should be disqualified. See, when we think of a team, whether it is in hockey, then a team that takes home the Stanley Cup has to win the most games. So we call them the victorious team. If it's in, in, in badminton, or if it's in, in uh, um, tennis, or if it's more of these, 
uh, where you run a race, where it's one person. Paul says that we, there are many runners, but only one receives the prize. So are you receiving the prize? In your Christian life, are you winning more than you are losing? We're not going to win every game. We're not going to win every match. But are we winning more than we are losing? The reason I ask that question is that those questions fit into the Christian walk. Have you signed up for the Christian tour? So are you a Christian? Have you come to the cross of Jesus Christ and admitted that you are a sinner? Admitted that you need a savior and asked him to forgive your sins? You've signed on to the Christian tour, if you want to call it that. You are a player in the Christian life. But is your game a complete failure? Are you losing match after match after match? Or are you winning some and then winning more? And is your game just continually getting better? As I look back at my Christian life, I can identify times of struggle. There's times where, where I was losing more than I was winning. There's times that I would say I felt like a complete failure. But now, many years later, Throughout, I, well, let me back up and say, one of the things I determined over the years is I wanted to walk closely with my coach, with Jesus Christ. I wanted to walk faithfully with him. I wanted to walk daily with him. I wanted to walk closely with him. And over the years, what I noticed is that I was, my game was getting better. We'll never be perfect. But the Christian life for us should be getting better. And why can I say that? Because we will play better, we will walk more like Christ as we spend time with him. And Paul says that a number of times. He says that you may walk, that you may live a life that is worthy of him. Why does he say that? You see, God, in, in his love for people, for mankind, he doesn't just want us to have a relationship him so that we can escape hell. I mean, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big uh, motivation. But what he really desires is a relationship that is a healthy and strong and functional relationship like children should have with their parents. That is enjoyable, that is fulfilling, that is healthy. He doesn't just want us to be called by his name, but he wants us to live like children of the kingdom. And though in my life I had some good mentors and, and I had some good accountability partners, what I can notice as I look back over my life is that the closer I was to Jesus the more vibrant my relationship with, was with Jesus, the better my game. The better, the more victorious my Christian walk. How close I was to Jesus had a great impact on how my life was lived. And as I looked at that, and I was thinking back on that as I was getting ready for this sermon, I realized there's one little word that comes into there because I, I, I'm not winning every game. And I don't know that I ever will win every game until the day I get to be home with Jesus. So how am I going to keep getting better at my game? And that little word is seek. Because that little word, seek, tells us about a heart attitude. Psalm 105, verse 4, it says, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Psalm 119 says, With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. 
I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Jeremiah chapter 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And then Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Seek. Seek. Constantly looking for the, that, that chasing after that relationship with my Savior. Recently in a sermon, Pastor Waldy, who's the pastor of care at West Point, where the EMC Church in Grand Prairie, where we are now uh, a part of, he made this comment. He says, if we want to conquer sin in our lives or continue to grow spiritually, we need more than accountability, more than mentors. We need Jesus. We need a closer relationship with Jesus. Press into Jesus is what he said. You see, all of these other things may be programs, they may be people, they may, but none of them are perfect except Jesus. He is. And, and uh, so you say, how does this connect with Hebrews chapter 1? Well, if you look at the top probably of your, your chapter 1 in Hebrews, it'll say something. My Bible says the supremacy of God's Son. Yours will probably say something similar because this chapter shows us that Jesus is supreme. And I think maybe that's why Watchman Nee, many years ago, he says God will, will answer all of our questions in one way and one way only by showing us more of Jesus. And the Jewish people, they, they had the Old Testament, they had Moses, they had they had the, the prophets. They had all of that. Their faith was, was grounded in the, the Old Testament law and the prophets. And they struggled a bit with this new Jesus to be supreme to that. And the book of Hebrews um, will, will continues more than just this chapter, will over and over show how Jesus fulfilled all of these things and is by far superior. And so in this chapter, we, we see how Jesus is superior to the angels. As we start reading, uh, or before we start reading, let's just pause for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence, we thank you that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only son that whoever believed in him would never perish but have eternal life. Jesus, you are that son. And you brought salvation to this earth when you came as a baby, where you lived, where you died, where you rose again. And as we discover this morning, Lord Jesus, we want to discover more about you we want to get to know you better, for that is the ultimate and the only answer that we need to all of our problems. But we need to seek and seek and seek. So thank you for your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. He starts out by saying, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Look at how he starts it. He says, long ago and many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So you think of it, to that to Isaiah, he, Isaiah uh, saw visions. We saw, see, uh, Daniel saw visions. God spoke to Jacob in a dream as well. To Abraham and Moses, he spoke personally. And so he says, in, in a variety of ways and in many ways, God spoke. And it was always revealing more of himself. Always revealing more of himself. 
But now he says, God spoke. So we got to realize that God is speaking. It says, now God spoke or has spoken through his son. Jesus is the fullness and the finality of all God's revelation. That's Jesus. And that's where he in these last days, he has spoken to us in the son. And the Jews struggled with that. Because they like that ongoing revelation of the prophets and, and, and the law. And they had no problem with, 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 with seeing or, or hearing then and hearing the word of God that. But to recognize Jesus as being God come in the flesh, that was a struggle for them. And that's why as we keep reading here, the writer goes on to prove to these people that Jesus is superior and look at the many many descriptions i don't know if you mark up your bible but if you did man you could basically just color this page in or this chapter in because if you think just listen to the words that it talks about them so in verse two here where we were it says that that he has spoken to us by his son well let me read through it and then we're going to come back and just pick out these phrases so he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For, which to, for to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become gotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved uprightness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will robe, roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Just look at the descriptors that are there. Jesus is the Son. He is appointed heir of all things. Through him, the whole world was created. And then he goes on to say that he is the radiance of the glory of God. He's the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is the one that made purifications for sin. He is sitting at the right hand of majesty on high. This is who Jesus is. To which of the angels did God ever say that or do that for them, give them such a position? His name is more excellent than the angels. He is the firstborn son. The angels worship him. Have you ever noted when you read through scripture and an angel appears, especially in the Old Testament, but appears to someone, and they want to worship him, and the angel doesn't let them worship him, because they too are created beings. And yet here we read that all the angels that cannot even receive our worship, worship Jesus. He, his throne is forever and ever. His scepter is one of uprightness. And he is anointed with the oil of gladness beyond everyone else, his companions. He laid the foundation of the world. 
His, the heavens, the earth, they're the work of his hands. And I love this next verse 11 and 12. He will remain unchangeable, unchangeable. His years will have no end. And he is the one who's sitting at the Father's right hand until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. The superiority of Jesus is he is the son of God, he is the son of man. And there is no one higher, there is no one greater. He is superior because he's the son. He's superior because he is God. If we look at, at, at verse, verse 10 there, it says that you, O Lord, laid the foundation of the world. In, in this passage, he is, uh, the writer is actually going back and quoting Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, but the writer applies that passage to Jesus. Is, isn't it interesting? What, what, like how, can, how can he say to him, your throne, O God? is forever and ever. He's referring to Jesus. And he's saying, O oh God, to Jesus. We see such a clear um, reference to Jesus being God. Our world is changing, isn't it? It continues to change. Try to stop it. Try to stop any of the changes that are going on in your community. We can influence for positive, we can influence in, in a good way. But guess what? The world isn't getting better, is it? There's a lot of changes in the world that are, that are troubling and, and very concerning. And yet Jesus is the same. He is the only one. He is the only one that has the authority to carry out his promises. That fact that he is at the right hand of the Father, you know what's so, so incredible about that? Because that is a position of power. It's a position of privilege. And you know, right now we're experiencing a dispensation, a time period of grace. Because Jesus has, has, has made salvation available to all of us. And when Jesus came as a baby, he came, or when he came uh, to, over 2,000 years ago, he came as a baby. But when he comes again, it's not as a baby. Will you turn with me to two passages of Scripture? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Revelation 1 and verse 7. When Jesus comes again, it says that one day... Chapter 1 and verse 7. One day he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. And just in case we think that that might only be believers that will see him, he says, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. We can choose to bow the knee before Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords now or this day when he comes and we will wail because it's too late. But we will still bow the knee. Philippians, the other passage is Philippians chapter 2. In, in, in Philippians... Uh, chapter 2, and let's, let's look at verse 9. Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to start reading at verse 9. Paul has just talked about Jesus being humbling himself and emptying himself. And uh, to the point of becoming obedient to the point of death, on a, even death on a cross. Verse 9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, 
in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus is. That's why he is superior to everything else. Because everything else is created, including the angelic world. Now, verse 7 and 14 give us a little picture of, of why we have angels. Now I'm back in Hebrews chapter 1, but gives us a little bit of picture because verse 7 says that he makes his angels winds, his ministers a flame of fire. So that describes the ministry of the angels. Verse 14 says that they are sent out to serve for the day, sake of those who are to inherit salvation. So for the Christians is the ones they serve. And they are important. They are powerful. But Jesus is above all of that. So how does this help us with that whole question of am I living a victorious Christian life? Am I winning more than I'm losing? I don't know where you're at this morning. But what I can promise you through Jesus is that you can win. You can win more than you lose. Through Jesus, you can live the Christian life to the fullest, but only through Jesus. Other people can help you. We need each other. Absolutely we need each other. But that's not enough. That's not enough. It is only Jesus and in his superiority that actually helps us to win, to receive the prize at the end of the race. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the one that gives us the power to be victorious. Lord, we are all sinners. We were born sinners. And some of us probably, Lord Jesus, gave our life to you, asked you to be our Savior when we were still uh, children. But none of us has gone through life without struggling with sin. And so we need you. There's no chain of addiction that you can't break. There are no dysfunctional relationships to which you can't bring healing. And so, Jesus, we invite you in your power, in your person as God, to come and to be our coach in this Christian walk so that we would live a life that is worthy of you, that we would be imitators, Heavenly Father, of you as dearly loved children, and that if we were to describe our Christian life, we would say, yes, it is victorious. And it continues to get better. Thank you that all of this, Jesus, is in you. In your most precious name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you for giving me the privilege of sharing God's word with you this morning. Is there a closing song? No, okay. Well, thank you, Peter, for sharing that with us. And uh, very good thoughts to think about. And let's walk in and, and being encouraged this week and encourage somebody else in their walk as well. And uh, again, we would like to invite every one of you to come and join us for something in the pot. I think we'll be lucky. If, again, and, and we can enjoy uh, fellowship together right out here. And everybody is welcome, whether you brought something or not, you are most welcome to come. 
And um, I'm just thinking, instead of just picking on Becky here about y'all, I think, A, I think we can, we can all enjoy this time together. <laughs> yeah, let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you that we can be together here in this way, and, and uh, thank you for the word that we've heard today. You are the creator the, of this universe, but even as Don shared to you make our load light and our, our burden light, and you love and care for each and every one of us. You care for me as in my daily walk, and I pray that I will realize this and I will walk in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for going with us in this for today and for this coming week. In your name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>